Please rise for the scripture reading. Our scripture this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 13, verses 1 to 3, and chapter 14, verses 21 to 28. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. They preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said. Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in each church and, with prayer and fasting, committed them to the Lord, in whom they had put their trust. After going through Pisidia, they came into Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. This is God's word. You can be seated. We have a special speaker this morning, our brother David Travis, who's been a member with us for the past nine months and who also is leading the men's Bible study uh, two Thursdays every month, second and fourth Thursdays. Thank you. Get all situated here. It's all new stuff to me. Jonathan, you did a great job reading all those names. Those are tough. Appreciate the invitation uh, or the uh, introduction. And uh, my wife and I, Connie, we did, uh, we have been here nine months. Matter of fact, it's almost nine months to the day that we walked, first time walked into the, the church here. And since we've been here, we, uh, we've learned to love this church and there's been a lot of love shown to us from this church. Uh, I was uh, recently in the hospital and uh, we had lots of visitors, lots of food. Uh, people came, prayed with us, prayed for us, continually got notes that people were praying for us. And, and we really, uh, we certainly appreciate that and, and uh, thank you for all that. Uh, this week, we're going to uh, continue in our study in the gospel uh, project in the book of Acts. And uh, you might wonder why Acts is so important. Well, Acts is the only biblical record that chronicles the history of the church immediately following Jesus' ascension. Um, It provides us with an account of how the church was able to grow and spread the gospel from Jerusalem uh, into the rest of the the, uh, Roman Empire. The uh, Acts can generally be divided into uh, two sections, and the first section that we've been going through is uh, primarily with the ministry of Peter in Jerusalem, and Samaria, and that was Acts uh, chapters 1 through 12. And the second is, uh, is following Paul on his missionary journeys through the Rome, um, uh, Roman Empire, and that's from first, uh, chapters 13 to 28, which is where our first reading came from this morning. We're starting this week uh, until the end of the book. Acts is uh, also, it's, it's a significant in that Uh, It chronicles the spread of the gospel, uh, not only geographically, but also culturally. It it records the transition from taking the gospel to an exclusively Jewish audience to the gospel going out among the Gentiles, primarily under the ministry of uh, the Apostle Paul. Well, I'm... Maybe I need to turn it on. That would probably be good. There we go. 
In the verse we just read, I, I am going to read them again. Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manan, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. These, these uh, verses describe the, the commissioning and sending of that first missionary team from a church. But what was unique is it was especially and specifically for the purpose of preaching and spreading the gospel to the world at large. This was a big deal. Uh, because this was the beginning of the missionary movement that has impacted the world for the spread of the gospel. Uh, churches exist today all over the world because of this missionary movement. This first journey made by Barnabas and Paul was, was, was the shortest in duration of Paul's ministry, missionary trips. They were gone about two years, and they traveled about 2,400 kilometers. Um, let's look at the, uh, the last words Jesus said about making disciples as he was speaking to them uh, right before his ascension. We know that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he remained for 40 days on the earth, and during that time he appeared several times to many of his followers and disciples. At his last appearance, which was right before he ascended to heaven, some of his last words are recorded in three, wor three, uh, three books of the, of the New Testament. This is that first missionary journey, and... Uh, In Matthew 28, <clears throat> 18 through 20, which most of us know as the Great Commission, Jesus' uh, words were recorded there by Matthew. It says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. And then in Mark 6, 15 through 16, he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. <clears throat> and then in Acts 1 8, the writer Luke recorded, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. When you read these verses, you might not interpret them to be uh, them as commands, but if you look at what Jesus said, especially in Matthew 28:18. The first thing Jesus does is establishes his authority, which was, as we see, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then based on that authority, which was all authority, he tells them what he expects them to do. Clearly, Jesus did command to his disciples that the gospel should be carried throughout the world and certainly beyond the boundaries and limits of the Jewish peoples. Jesus' command was for his disciples to go and make disciples everywhere and to teach them to obey everything he commanded. Now, that command was not just to those disciples right there. It was for future disciples the command to make disciples and teach them to obey would carry on to the, to the next generation of disciples and to the next and the next who are then to still go and make disciples. This command has not been rescinded. It is still valid for us today. In a previous week's study, we heard about the Jerusalem church and the growth that had occurred there. It was a good church, 
it was a growing church, and they were, be, they were making disciples. How that, however, that church, church's focus was reaching primarily Jews in and around Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, there was much resistance to share with anyone other than Jews. And even though Jesus' last words were clearly to spread the gospel to the entire world and all peoples, um, they were not doing that. <clears throat> Another week, our study in the Gospel Project covered the Lord speaking to Philip. He told Philip to go south on the road to Gaza, which is where he met the Ethiopian eunuch, who was not a Jew, and Philip... Uh, Philip explained to him the word of God and shared the gospel with him, and he believed and was baptized. And then Philip was miraculously transported to another area in Azotus where he began to preach. We had another study. We heard about the Spirit of God prompting Peter, who was still strongly resisting associating with Gentiles. Peter was told to go with some men who were going to show up at his house. He did go with them. He was obedient and then did go with them. And he witnessed to a Gentile, Cornelius, who was a Roman centurion. And, he, and, and Cornelius and those in his house were saved. On his return to Jerusalem, Peter even boldly shared that the gospel should not be withheld from the Gentiles. But we see, even though Jesus had commanded his disciples to make disciples to the end of the world and to all peoples, they had not made any significant attempts to do this. With the the exception of those who ended up being driven out of Jerusalem by persecution, they had remained primarily in and around Jerusalem focusing on Jews. From these two instances, it it does appear that God was prompting them to begin to spread the gospel to the world. And despite these instances of being directed to share with Gentiles, the disciples, the Jerusalem church, and believers in Judea continued to hold the gospel to themselves and made no attempt to, uh, to purposely go outside of their territory and people. If, think about this, If this would not have changed, who knows what Christianity would look like today? Where would it be? As we read these stories in in Acts, it may appear to you that uh, the sequence of events occurred during a relatively short time span. But what is described in these first 13 chapters of Acts actually occurs over quite a few years. Uh, there are various timelines that have been tried to be compiled of, of all these events, and, and some do fluctuate events by several years, mainly because there's just no, there was just no record of dates, and there's no spe- specific events mentioned to time to, or to relate them to. But I want us to look at, this is just a, uh, just a, uh, a broad, timeline of the things that occurred. We know that Jesus was crucified right before Passover, and he was buried and then raised after three days. We also know that he appeared multiple times to his followers and and disciples for 40 days. He speaks the commission to go and make disciples of all nations, and then he ascended to heaven. After he ascended, the Holy Spirit that he had promised appeared and, uh, uh, and came seven days later on Pentecost. And Pentecost is celebrated 50 days after the Passover. And at that time, we also know that the church in Jerusalem was born. For the next year, Christianity grew very quickly and spread in Jerusalem. Approximately two or three years after Jesus had been crucified is when Stephen was stoned and martyred, and martyrdom and persecution of the church began. In another four or five years, 
which was about one year after Stephen was stoned to death, was when Paul was confronted by Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul accepted Jesus. Now, sometime during this interim period is when the uh, persecuted believers fled Jerusalem and some men went to Antioch and preached the gospel to Gentiles and the church there was born. Now we're up seven or eight years past Jesus being crucified that the Jerusalem church had heard about a church of Gentiles in Antioch. And they sent Barnabas to that church to check things out, find out what was going on there. And then 11 to 12 years after Paul had met Jesus on the road to Damascus is when he and Barnabas were sent on his first missionary journey by a mostly Gentile church uh, in Antioch. So in total, it's now been 17, 18, maybe even a little longer, years since Jesus had been crucified on the cross until the first missionary journey to purposely take the gospel in the world to take uh, uh, into the world took place so let's look back a little bit into chapter 11 and see how the church in Antioch began Now those who'd been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. In these verses, we're told even with the persecuted Christians fleeing, the focus was still to share the good news only among Jews. Fortunately, we read that some unknown and unnamed men of those who were scattered began to sharing the gospel with the Greeks or Gentiles. As a result, the first Gentile church was founded and started in Antioch. It was, it was in Antioch that Christians, that uh, disciples were first called Christians. And Antioch eventually becomes the new center for Christian for Christians. It's a little, it's a little ironic, I think, that the church, Antioch church, was founded as a result of the persecution that Saul, Paul, was a leader in. If, you were, if we were to continue to read the next verses, we see how Barnabas came to Antioch, which I mentioned in the timeline, and that was he was sent from the church in Jerusalem to go check out this church that, they, that they'd heard about in Antioch. We don't know exactly why, but it, if you read the text, it appears that it, if... if uh, it may have been for the purpose of trying to, to shut that church down and what was going on there. <clears throat> and then we, we later see that Barnabas now goes to Tarsus, finds Paul, and brings Paul back to the Antioch church as a teacher and a leader in that church. And Ironically, it's also the place that probably helped mature Paul to grow in his ministry and perfect his message and prepare him for his future missions. And then the Antioch church leaders were used by God to send Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. So I just find that very interesting and very ironic how God used all of these events to cause this to happen. Looking again at our focal verses and the role of the church, at Antioch in the church, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. 
We see in this passage the leaders of the church were doing what church leaders should be doing. They were ministering before the Lord. Now, that word denotes the performance of official duties uh, of any kind and was used expressly to, uh, to express the priestly functions under the Old Testament. But here, it signifies the corresponding duties in the Christian church. And, and they were probably fasting for the purpose of seeking special guidance from, the, from God. It was during this time that the, the Holy Spirit spoke to the church leaders and told them to take action, which was to set apart Barnab uh, Barnabas and Paul for the work which they were called. Now, that phrase indicated that there, was, there had been a previous call in their lives for mi missionary work. We know specifically that Paul had this calling as when, when the Lord sent Ananias to go, to go meet with Paul after Paul had been blinded uh, and he was resistant to do that, that the Lord told, told uh, Ananias that Paul was God's chosen instrument to proclaim the, his name to the Gentiles and to the people of Israel. But the church had a special role in this. Although there had been a call in the lives of these men to share the gospel to the world. And, and as we saw, Paul's call now had been over 12, 12 years before. It was not until the church, led by the Holy Spirit, commissioned them and sent them off that they did finally go. It's clear that the church played a prominent role in the beginning of the missionary movement, and it is a model for us today. God added this new mission for the church to send missionaries. Whose mission is it? Well, it is a mission of the church. It's a mission of this church. A mission of this church is missions and missionaries to make disciples, sending them, supporting, encourage, encouraging them and training those to who are, are called to be sent. The direction given to the Antioch church was not to send everyone though. There was never any intention that everyone is supposed to go. It sent those who were set apart and called to go. But that doesn't mean their job or our job is totally done. There was still work to be done there. We see in that, that Jesus' final words to his disciples in Acts 1.8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I hope you can see this map of the Israel at the time of Jesus. In this verse, Jesus was talking to his disciples right there where they were living near Jerusalem. And on this map, you can see Jerusalem, and surrounding Jerusalem is Judea. And the next area outside of Judea is Samaria. But we don't live in any of those places. So, how does that apply to us today? Well, I think if Jesus were talking to us right here, right now, right here, right now, he might tell us, our Jerusalem is Tabe. Our Judea is the area surrounding Tabe. Maybe the northern section of the island, our Samaria is perhaps the rest of the country of Taiwan, and then on to the ends of the world. Some will be sent far away, some not quite so far away, and some are supposed to stay right here where they are. There is a mission. The locations may be different, but it's the same for all of us who, who, who are disciples of Christ, and that is to share the gospel and make disciples. Charles Haddon Spurgeon was a great preacher in the 19th century England. 
He was so popular that when he died in 1892, London went into mourning. Nearly 60,000 people came to pay homage during the three days that his body laid in state in the Metropolitan Tabernacle where, where he preached for many years. He preached at least normally two, two services on a Sunday with up to 6,000 people in each one of those services. And he didn't have microphones. I don't know how he did it, and I don't know what he did for them to hear him, but, and I don't know what his voice sounded like, but it probably was a, a big, booming, profound voice. But some 100,000 lined the streets as a funeral parade, two miles long, followed his hearse from the tabernacle to the cemetery. Flags in the city flew at half mast, and shops and pubs were closed. In one of his great sermons in 1873, he dealt with the, the mission of, of disciples and Christians a lot more eloquently than I could ever ever do it, and here's what he had to say. If Jesus is precious to you, you will not be able to keep your good news to yourself. You will be whispering it into your child's ear. You will be telling it to your husband. You will be earnestly imparting it to your friend. Without the charms of eloquence, you will be more than eloquent. Your heart will speak and your eyes will flash as you talk of his sweet love. Every Christian here is either a missionary or an imposter. Recollect that. You either try to spread abroad the kingdom of Christ or else you do not love him at all. It cannot be that there is a high appreciation of Jesus and a totally silent tongue about him. Of course, I do not mean by that that those who use the pen are silent. They are not. And those who help others to use the tongue or spread that which others have written are doing their part well. But that man who says, I believe in Jesus, but does not think enough of Jesus ever to tell another about him by mouth or pen or tract is an imposter. You are either doing good or you are not good yourself. If thou knowest Christ, thou art as one who has found honey. Thou wilt call others to taste it. Thou art like the lepers who found the food which the Syrians had cast away. Thou wilt go to Samaria and tell the hungry crowd that thou hast found Jesus and art anxious that they should find him too. Be wise in your generation and speak of him in fitting ways at fitting times and so in every place proclaim the fact that Jesus is most precious to your soul. <clears throat> Before Paul and Barnabas completed their, this missionary journey, they made a few more strategic steps. Back again in Acts 14, 21 through 28, they preached the gospel in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples, encouraging them to remain true to the faith. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God, they said, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders for them in the, each church with prayer and fasting, committing, committed them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. After th going through Pisidia, they came to Pamphylia, and when they had preached the word in Perga, they went down to Atalia. Atalia. From Atalia, they sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now completed. On arriving there, they gathered the church together and reported all that God had done through them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles, and they stayed there a long time with the disciples. As I told you, they were gone for two years. 
And on their way back, they stopped in each location where they had preached, and they met with these new disciples to encourage them to remain firm in the faith, even, though, even when tough trials would come. They knew tough trials were coming. Before they would leave, I'm sure they probably evaluated the work that was going on in these new locations. They, they evaluated the people who were the new disciples. They identified leaders, and they appointed leadership to each one of those churches to help them to grow as healthy, thriving congregations and lead them and lead those churches so that they would continue in the work even stronger. You see, God wants healthy, strong, thriving churches to help carry out his mission. Then they left and returned to their starting point, the church at Antioch and gathered them together. And if you read the words, they shared all of the things that had happened. There were some bad things that happened, but they probably focused on mainly the good things. They just, they had a big old praise celebration for all that was accomplished. That is so important to let people know who are not a part, who are a part of something but don't actually get to see the end result, the successful end results of it, but to give them a little glimpse of, of, of the glory that they had experienced. That is, that's an encouragement to them to continue to be faithful in the mission. Recently, as our mission teams returned from their mission trip, each week, for several weeks, we had people that had gone on that mission trip come here and share their experiences, not only of how it impacted the, it, it, it impacted the lives of the people they went to, to, to work with, but also, in so many cases, how it impacted their lives. And we'll look forward to that happening here in a few weeks when, they, when this mission team returns. So, what is the mission? The mission is to make disciples. Whose mission is it? It's a mission of this church. It's your mission, and it's my mission. If you're called to go, we want you to go. And the church wants to help you go. But, it, but we saw in Antioch, not everyone was called to go. So if you are to remain, here's some ways you can go on mission right now with Great Grace Baptist Church. Pray. We need to be individually praying, but we also need to be a strong praying church. We have a prayer meeting every Wednesday night. Come and pray with brothers and sisters in corporate prayer. Pray for missionaries every day. Pray for this church and the people to be obedient to the work of sharing the gospel. Pray for the lost people that you know. Right now there is a need for mature people to provide mentoring and oversight to young believers and to help develop new leaders. This church needs workers, needs faithful workers in Awanas and other children's ministries. They tell me that morning tea needs more men to help. That's a time of fellowship. It's a time of coming together, getting to know people that come to church with us. When we have potlucks and other community events, we need people to participate and help build a sense of community and strengthen the church to be a strong church to do the work of, that God has called us to do. This church right now has a need to create more small, Bible, small group Bible studies. So we will need people to lead those studies 
If you're not a leader, we, we need people to, who are willing to open their homes to host small groups. We need involvement in student ministry and youth. There's a great mission field right across the street with young people from all the wor- over the world coming to us that we can reach for the gospel. This church needs to be more involved in mission work within Taiwan, which is our Judea and our Samaria. I'm sure there are many more needs. These are just some that I discussed with the pastor before he left on his trip. But these are some that we have right now. And I'm inviting you to get involved. As we conclude, if you're a believer in Christ and there's a question in your mind about whether you should be involved in this mission, then consider this. John 14, 15. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commands. If you're here this morning and you have not put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I can assure you he wants to have a relationship with you. When Jesus was speaking with the Pharisee, Nicodemus, late one night, he told him a a verse that was familiar to most of you, but for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and whoever believes in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. The whole world, God loves you. Jesus also clearly said about himself, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. There's one way to have a relationship with the Father, and that's through his Son, Jesus Christ. If you feel that God is calling you to a relationship with him, I invite you to come and meet with me or or Nettie at the front here in just a few moments. If you're not a member of, a, of this church and you're looking for a church home, I invite you to join us and become a part of our mission and ministries. If you have other needs this morning, I invite you to come meet with us and let us pray with you. As we sing t- together now, now is the time for you to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray now that we would hear the words, not my words, Father, but the words from your, from your, your book, and that we would, we would be faithful to the call to, make, to go forth and to make disciples here and to the ends of the world. And Father, for any that are here today that feel that you're feel the Holy Spirit calling them to have a relationship with you, Father. I pray that you would give them courage today to make that commitment. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.